Welcome. I'm Carl Frederick, and I will be interviewing individuals for Kenosha Voices, an oral history project of the Kenosha County Historical Society in conjunction with Kenosha Community Media. I have worked in newspapers for more than 40 years as an editor and a reporter. 38 and a half of those years were at the Kenosha News. I am also a member of the Kenosha County Historical Society Board. We hope you enjoy these programs. I'm speaking with Rabbi Dina Feingold from the uh, Beth Hillel Temple. She is the uh, Rabbi Emerita. And tell me, Rabbi, um, how did you come to be in Kenosha? Well, at, in 1985, I was serving as a rabbi in Milwaukee, suburban Milwaukee, Fox Point, Congregation Shalom. And it was my first pulpit out of rabbinical school. I was an assistant rabbi. And um, I, it, assistant rabbi is typically a two or three year um, position. And I was in my third year. And I was looking for where I was going to go next to serve as a rabbi. I had an interest in serving as a solo rabbi in a congregation, not being the number two or the number three. Um, and uh, so at the time, the position in Kenosha opened up. And I, I did do a search to other positions around the country, but this one was particularly um, uh, particularly appropriate because I had met my husband at the time we were just dating and he was working as an attorney in Milwaukee and I wanted to um, uh, not go far away. And were you familiar with the congregation here? I was familiar with it because I, I grew up in so southern Wisconsin in Janesville which is in central southern Wisconsin and as a teenager, I was part of a youth group called the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization. And we had gatherings of teens from other small communities several times a year. And one of them each year was always at Beth Hillel in Kenosha. And so I was familiar with the building. I was familiar with some of the families because I was peers with their kids and we were in this youth group together. Okay. And uh, at what point did you decide rabbinical school was for you? I was in college. I was looking for a career. I was looking for um, an advanced degree after an undergraduate degree in what field I would want to go into. It was very new at the time. This was, I entered college in 1973. So it was very new that there was even such a thing as a female rabbi because the first woman was ordained in 1972. But that idea was out there, and I, it appealed to me because I was finding that all of the electives that I was taking in college were some aspect of Jewish study, and I was majoring in public speaking, communications, and public address. And um, so I thought, what you know, if I want to continue on in my studies, I love studying Judaism. Um, I focusing on public speaking that would seem to be being a pulpit rabbi was a good career fit for me. Mm -hmm. I love Judaism. I, w I love being, I was a uh, uh, leader in our youth group, in our regional youth group, and I uh, love being part of the Jewish community. So it seemed like um, that would be an appropriate career choice for me, even though at the time it was a very unusual career choice. Okay, so you graduated from college in 1977, and then yeah. you went to rabbinical school. How long of a process was that? Five and, years, okay. and I went directly from college to rabbinical school. The first year is in Israel, and then the remaining four years you choose one of the campuses in the United States. I went to the one in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, and then how did you actually become the rabbi at Beth Hillel? So there, it's an interview and hiring process. Um, in our movement, they don't place you in, in a congregation. You look at what's available. Congregations are looking for a rabbi. They look at the candidates, and um, there's an interview and hiring process. So I was interviewed at the temple in um, spring of 1985 to begin the position in the summer of 1985. Were there any situations or any controversy about you coming to Beth Hillel? I understand that there was, although I, it was not 
it's something I knew when I was in the process. I met with a, a very nice and welcoming committee uh, that hired me, but I understand there were people who were skeptical that um, their first, their, their rabbi should be a female rabbi because it was still a very new concept. What were some of the concerns that they had? Oh, I, I don't really know exactly, but there was a lot of prejudice in, in various fields that, you know, when, when a woman can't do this job. I suspect that some of them were, can she carry a very heavy Torah scroll? Will she cry at a funeral? Um, will her voice be strong enough to carry on the pulpit? Um, maybe there were concerns she's going to get married and have kids and, and leave us. Um, no one ever articulated these concerns to me, but I know there was skepticism um, because I was told that after the fact and that I won people over. And how heavy is the Torah scroll? Well, th the ones we have at the temple are particularly heavy and tall. I, I think they're about 30 pounds, but they're also quite tall and it's, um, you know, it's not something that you would want to um, carry around with you all day, <laughs> but uh, certainly to take it out of the ark where it's kept and put it on the table for reading or even carry it around the room in what we call a hakafa or a circuit with the Torah so it can be close to the people, um, it's very doable. Okay. And uh, how did you find the congregation itself? I mean, what kind of a congregation did you come into? Well, when I came here in 1985, it was really an older congregation that looked like it might be on the decline. Um, it was made up of mainly older people, probably 60 and above. There were very few young families with children. Um, the kids who had been raised in the congregation and that were my peers and youth group had left the community. Um, they didn't come back and settle here for the most part. And so, um, and it was typical. Uh, uh, there were many co small congregations at the time in, in the Midwest that were sort of on the decline. Those communities were on the decline. And um, so it was sort of, you might think that the congregation would be um, in one day not exist anymore. Okay. So um, you came into the job not knowing there were concerns, but yourself, how did you perceive I am coming in as a solo rabbi to a congregation? I felt I was ready. I had three years of experience in the, in the pulpit rabbinate, even though I wasn't the number one rabbi. I had had lots of experience in doing all the things a rabbi does. And um, I felt confident and ready to serve the congregation. Did you have any goals or things you wanted to do as rabbi? I, I guess, you know, one of the goals I had it relates to how I grew up. I grew up in Janesville, as I said, where there was never a synagogue. It was a much smaller Jewish community than Kenosha. And um, I was the only Jewish child my age and my age group, my class in school the entire time I was growing up. Um, so I think I was looking forward to bringing to the congregation this idea that even in a small community where there aren't many Jews, there's a lot that we can do to um, live Jewish life and to um, feel like we have a full Jewish experience. And I think I wanted to bring that to the congregation. Okay, and um, did the congregation begin to grow? I mean, Yes, it did. I mean, there were some scary moments, like in 1989 when Chrysler pulled out of Kenosha, um, not just for the temple, but I think the whole community was a little bit nervous about what was going to become of Kenosha. And as most people probably watching this would know, it actually turned out to be that Kenosha turned around and turned itself into a place that was attractive for people to come to. And the temple benefited from that in the 1990s. Um, some families uh, with children moved to the community because they took a professional job in the community, particularly what comes to mind is a few doctors uh, moved to town. And then others came because the housing was, they could get the same house for less money and less taxes in Wisconsin than in Illinois where they were from, and so they moved to Wisconsin 
a lot of people moved to the new, what was then a new development, white caps, um, because they could live here and still keep their jobs in Illinois. And so the temple started attracting these younger, newer families that had come for these various reasons in the 1990s. Okay, was there ever a time where you thought, maybe this isn't the place for me? Was there ever early on or in, 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 in the time? I think initially my husband and I weren't sure how long we would be here because we didn't know if the congregation would continue to um, survive. But I think that was pretty early on, that was something that we realized was not going to be an issue, that the congregation was going to survive, we were going to have peers, our kids were going to have classmates. Um, there were times when something was out there that I considered, oh, that might be an interesting position to take, or I was approached by congregations, would you, would you apply for this position? And ultimately, I decided that no, we, I really wanted to stay where I was, and I really liked this idea of um, serving in a smaller community and serving a smaller congregation. It was a good fit for me and for my family. Now, you mentioned that your, your husband had a practice in Milwaukee. Yeah. And you are the rabbi in Kenosha. Yeah. Did you live in Kenosha? Did you we, live yeah, in Milwaukee? Pretty Did much you have a time we, where you... For, for the most part, we lived in Kenosha and he commuted. Um, but there was a time in uh, when our kids were in middle school, elementary, middle school, and high school, that for various reasons we wanted to put our kids in school in Milwaukee. Our daughter, we wanted her to go to the Jewish day school there. There's no Jewish day school in Kenosha. And um, our son, um, we wanted him to go to Whitefish Bay High School where our, my husband had gone. And our, my husband's parents lived there. And um, so for eight years, we lived in an apartment in Whitefish Bay during the week, and we lived in Kenosha on the weekends, and I commuted. Um, and I took a slightly lesser um, position, my position was reduced by some hours and some weekends so that I could do that without killing myself. <laughs> so, so how did you divide the week up? So I didn't come to Kenosha on Monday and Wednesday, um, and I fit everything into Tuesday, Thursday, and of course Friday, because our services are on Friday night and some Saturday mornings. Um, and then all of us came down for the weekend for the most part. Uh, that got challenging when our children were teenagers and had lives in Milwaukee. <laughs> there was a lot of back and forth. Um, but and even on Monday and Wednesday when I was in Milwaukee, I was doing a lot of prep work and preparing uh, for meetings or services or what have you. And you know, so there was someone in the hospital at one of the Milwaukee hospitals. I would make sure to visit them on a Monday or Wednesday because I'd rather do that than go back to Milwaukee on Tuesday or Thursday or the weekend. Um, it worked out, it was kind of crazy, but again, it was a choice that we made for our family, and I think we're very glad that we did it. Um, but when my daughter graduated from Whitefish Bay High School in 2009, then we moved back here again full time. We never sold our house that we had here. We've been there for 37 years. Okay, how large was the congregation when you came here? I think it was about 90 families, maybe slightly under 90 families. And today? Um, it's about 122, I believe, right now. It's fluctuated there in, in the hundreds for the most part. It's maybe at its height. Well, I was here, it was maybe 135 families, and maybe it's gone down to 105 or something, but it sort of stayed in that range. Okay. Were there any individuals that really helped you out when you first came? Well, when we first came here, um, my husband and I were invited to a dinner before we got here, actually, at the home of Helen and John Plaus, and we were invited to come and be with all of the young families, or I think it was all of the Kenosha young families. There were a couple that lived in Racine as well. Um, and it was four families. It was Helen and John Plaus, Linda and Dick Selzberg, may he rest in peace, um, Esther and Marv Letvin. They did live in Racine, I take that back. Um, and Jan and Steve Goldberg, and I should say about Jan too, may she rest in peace. Um, 
and they said, here, you know, this is, this is it. <laughs> this is the young families. And, and we were about 10 years younger than they were. But they took us in, they befriended us, and um, they, they were some of the key people that really supported me and my rabbinate and us and, you know, coming to be a part of this community when I first came. So what were the, some of the things um, community-wide? You said at one point that you were interested in community and being a part of yeah, that. Yeah. So what did, what did you get involved in? And how I, did that come to be? I always was interested in interfaith work and I think maybe that my interest in it came, number one, from growing up in Janesville where I was the only Jewish kid my age and whether I wanted to be or not, I was kind of a spokesperson for Judaism. You know, even in my class as an elementary school student when a Jewish holiday come, came up, I would talk about it and youth group, I remember we did some things with Christian youth groups, you know, in town because uh, there were just so few of us and um, I, maybe I was already a little rabbi teaching about Judaism as a kid. Um, but also, um, my rabbi growing up, Rabbi Manfred Swarzenski in Madison, Wisconsin, we went to Madison to synagogue because there wasn't one in Janesville. Um, he was really active in interfaith work and I very much admired and respected what he did. So he was friends with, you know, the Unitarian minister in Madison and, the, you know, the priests and he taught at the Catholic College and I, I thought that that was um, something that a rabbi should do. So I, I noticed when I was in Milwaukee at kind of a, a very heavily Jewish suburban area that there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to be involved in interfaith work or issues in the community unless I sought it out and pursued it, which I did. I was very involved, for example, in um, domestic violence, uh, in interfaith domestic violence women's group trying to help uh, women who had domestic violence issues deal with some of the religious issues that they came up with when they went to their pastor or rabbi, tried to be more, you know, welcoming and encouraging to those folks from a religious lens. But I had to pursue those things. And I thought that in a community like Kenosha that it would be easier for me to get involved in those things. And that turned out to be true. When I came to Kenosha, I was immediately told this is when the Kenosha clergy association meets and you should come and be a member and I went to all of those monthly meetings for networking and speakers and we also did some joint programming like a joint Thanksgiving service and a joint Holocaust service a, a, a commemoration which that that service continues to this day. Okay, it sounds like there was some social justice involved yes, with the and, domestic and violence. Yes, and I also wanted to do some work on issues in the community. And Beth Hillel has really been involved in those kinds of things since way before I came. For example, they were one of the congregations that started what's now known as the Shalom Center. It was a group of interfaith congregations that came together initially to deal with the problem of hunger in Kenosha and establish the soup kitchen. And it's always had an interfaith board, and, and Beth Hillel has almost always had a representative on that board. Um, so the congregation was already doing some of that kind of thing, um, involved in the crop walk for hunger as well that used to be held every year. Um, and so I was happy that there was that inclination, but I wanted to, you know, do more in the community. Was there someone in your congregation who was kind of there to? nudge you ahead a little yeah, bit? Yeah, not initially, not initially, but um, sometime in the 1990s, um, a woman named Harriet Lavin, who is still an active member of the congregation and uh, lives in western Racine County on a farm, uh, she was very much interested in doing social justice work, and so she helped me really um, grow the, the congregation's commitment to social justice beyond just serving at the soup kitchen and um, walking in the crop walk um, to more issues and more active involvement in, in various things. And also, the, the, when Cush started in Kenosha, 
around the year 2000. And CUSH is what? Congregations United to Serve Humanity. It is an affiliate of a larger organization statewide called Wisdom. It's faith-based community organizing, and the whole premise of it is that you come together people of, of, who want to, people of different faiths who want to work on issues in the community, and you choose issues in your community that you want to work together on to make positive change. And um, that was something that I was one of the people who was, one of the people who signed the in, or initial um, covenant, I think we called it, to start the organization. And um, that has also, as Beth Hillel being a part of it, has helped us be involved in the community. Are there, or were there issues that were closer to you than others? Um, I would say that um, immigration, education, and public schools, promoting uh, equity in the public schools, and um, racial equity were the m most issues of greatest interest to me and concern to me. And how did each of those develop or have successes or less than successes? Yeah. Um, the education piece, um, we really primarily worked on and, um, mentoring and reading tutors, getting our congregations to get involved in that work in the public schools. Quite a few people from the temple got involved in that and, and from other congregations as well. And they continue to do that to this day. Um, in the immigration field, I think probably our greatest success, I mean, we had various things we did over the years to try to help immigrants in our community or statewide, but in last year, uh, 2023, uh, an Afghani family was actually brought to Kenosha um, through Kush, and three congregations got together to, in a very hands-on way, help them acclimate to life in the United States. And that was very successful and a lot of hard work. The family ultimately moved to be with other Afghani families in a different community. But for eight months, that was a, a very um, important, I think, and successful effort. Was there uh, any other issues where there was an effort to try to establish some, a facility or something that could help the whole community or was there anything else that you were involved in? Uh, Kush was definitely involved in m trying to get the Shalom Center better, a better building and, and a broader program um, from being at the old school on 62nd Street where it first started out. Um, and they have pushed a lot on the issue of homelessness and um, worked very hard to make that facility more not just the soup kitchen, but at the family shelter and, and all those other wraparound services that it has now. Um, Were there any programs or things you organized for the temple and its congrega the congregation? Are you talking about social justice now? Or? Anything that you've done while here uh, within the congregation, things you've done for the congregation, involving the congregation. Um, I think some of our greatest successes uh, during the time I was here was creating a program for a weekend retreat away, an interge intergenerational retreat for families um, or singles or uh, people of all different types of families at our regional camp in Oconomowoc and we did that every other year for, uh, we probably did it 10 or 12 times. It was a very successful program. Uh, we took three trips to Israel as a congregation. Um, and I think that during the time I was here, we really broadened our adult education agenda and offered lots of more different types of classes and got more people involved in taking classes of various types of interest in Judaism. One of the most popular has been the adult bar and bat mitzvah program, which is for adults who never had the chance to go to Hebrew school or um, have a bar bat mitzvah which involves reading from the Torah scroll and leading the congregation in worship. Um, many, many people, I don't know how many exactly, maybe 40 or 50 people over the years 
have learned that and um, you know felt it mainly went in it probably to feel a sense of competence in Jewish worship, not necessarily leading services, but they did take that step when they had their adult bar bat mitzvah. And have you brought people in for the congregation to experience speakers or anything like that? Um, yes, we've had many guest speakers over the years and courses that I've offered that were like a, you know, a, a eight or ten week uh, long class. Um, and we've, for many years, we've brought in uh, cultural programs of Jewish interest and opened it up to the community. Um, for a long time, this, this program, which was called the Shemro series, um, before I came, it was something that people in the community would buy the series tickets and they would come to all the programs in the series. Um, by the time I came, it was fewer programs, but people in the community looked forward to coming to Beth Hillel maybe once a year, maybe twice a year to hear a Jewish storyteller or a Jewish musician or a play that we were putting on that was of, um, you know, something, a, a Jewish cultural experience that that was the only place they could really get that in Kenosha. It was very successful. Okay, when did you begin thinking about retirement? Well, I actually signed a final contract in 2015 um, indicating that I would retire in 2025. Now we're having this conversation in 2024. So it happened a year earlier than that at, of, at my choosing um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, personal reasons, uh, be, becoming a grandmother and wanting to be able to be available to both my son and daughter's families and their grandchild. Um, my husband becoming somewhat disabled and wanting to make sure that we had time to travel and do the things we want to do before maybe someday it won't be as, as possible as it is right now. And also the last few years have been very, uh, very difficult years with um, COVID, um, that whole COVID year having to do temple programming and services uh, in an online format, having to learn um, how to stream services and have all this technical aspect of um, doing services once we came back to the synagogue. Um, Anti-Semitism has been on the rise throughout the world and we have had to add layers of security to our building. Uh, actual you know physical uh, items that we've added cameras and alarms and so on that we never had before and we have personnel security personnel at every service and every event where there's a sizable amount of people in attendance um, and so all of that are added stressors to the job that were never there before and, and I think that did take a toll on me and you know I was just getting older and everything that, all the things that one does in the life of a rabbi, it's a very intense schedule. It was, you know, getting a little harder. I was getting a little more tired. So um, I thought it was time. Okay. Um, I'm sure that you had a, a farewell kind of ceremony get together with the congregation. What do you think they would say about your time here? I think that um, the congregation really appreciated that I was very welcoming and warm to whoever came in the building. And that we created together, I can't say I personally did it, but we created together a very a family-like atmosphere, a welcoming, um, we want you here, you are, you belong here kind of atmosphere in the congregation that um, I tried to make whatever we did and however many or sometimes few people were there for a program to make it feel up to them like it was worthwhile, that they came to something that was really worthwhile and that they had a good time and that they learned something and um, it, was, it was worth their time to be there. I really, I really pushed um, myself and tried to try to focus 
what would happen in the building being a positive experience, whether for kids or for adults, to be what they would walk out with. Okay, now you mentioned in retirement, grandchildren. You mentioned some traveling. How does the rest of your retirement look? I'm trying to be open to what that might look like and not plan it out. Um, to see what comes my way and just to um, be in the moment and um, feel out what this whole experience is going to be like. My husband just retired as well, so we're sort of doing that together. And um, I'll have to see, I'm only three weeks into it right now, so I, I don't have a very a broad experience in what it feels like. Is but I this want something to new and difficult for you? Very much so, yeah. I'm, uh, I've been a driven person with that responds to a schedule that has deadlines and meet the deadlines and um, has a stream of email coming in that I have to respond to and feel responsible to. And that, that stream just is gone, which is so very you, strange. You put the calendar away. <laughs> I still have my calendar, but um, the stream of things that are coming in is like a spigot turned off. And it's, uh, it's a brand new experience, and so far I'm really enjoying it. Well, thank you for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for interviewing me. I appreciate it.